the, the problem with the whole understanding of truth in our, in our world, our globalized world, or our postmodern, depending on how people want to define it. Um, but the fact is that we've moved from truth as something objective, something real, something independent, to truth really as a state of my feelings, my preferences, of my taste. So many of the debates of our time, whether they're about facts that have happened in history, or events going on in our culture, or moral issues, whatever they are, are purely framed as in terms of someone's preference. And uh, really, I feel, therefore I am, becomes the kind of a, the mantra of our time. This is the part that really surprised me, because I know you picked up that phrase from C.S. Lewis, but uh, I always thought of relativism or subjectivism as something that really sort of impacted culture maybe in the last 20 years, 25 mm -hmm. years, but C.S. Lewis was concerned about it in the 1940s. Oh, absolutely. Tell, tell us about that. Yeah. When, when did this type of thinking first sort of emerge into Western thought? Um, and give us a little bit of the history of subjectivism. Well, as an idea, of course, it has a, a kind of modern incarnation, but in many respects, it actually goes way back to the Sophists, to the, to the early Greeks, because in Greece, you had the, actually a kind of confluence of the ideas that we have at the present time. You had the, the myths and people under the gods, Homer and the Odyssey and so forth. You had the rationalists with Plato and Aristotle, and then you had the Sophists, who basically the truth was basically uh, an issue of power, a tool to be used, that truth was whatever you wanted, whatever worked. Well, that could be said in a modern university today. So in the more, the more modern incarnations, I think, go back to the, the disillusionment of the 20th century. So you have this sort of evolutionary views coming from Darwin. You have Marx saying that all of life is economics. You have uh, uh, Freud with the subterranean dimensions of how we know it reality. And you're going back really to Descartes earlier and that and, and Kant, that truth is something that we know internalized is something is in our, in other words, we know truth in our minds, but we don't know what's going on out externally. So I think there, was, there were forces and events that led to uh, um, a deconstruction of classical views. And when, when Lewis spoke, it was 1943. It was the rise of the totalitarians. We had seen Franco, you had Stalin, and of course you had Hitler on the move. And the idea was, well, whose truth and justice? Did the Nazis have truth? Did Stalin have truth? Whose truth? Well, this is fascinating to me because I think the way this shows up in most people's daily dialogue is not in the philosophical categories we Correct. just talked about, but it's like, hey, it's true for me, mm -hmm. but it may not be true for you. Or what's true for you isn't true for me, or that's right for me, but mm -hmm. not necessarily right for you. And, and I think a lot of people find that to be a very frustrating argument. And yet what you're saying or what you're suggesting from your study of history and philosophy, that seems to be part of the human condition. Every generation oh, yeah. returns to it. I think so. I think basically human, you know, many years ago there was the film The Few Good Men with and mm -hmm. everybody knows the iconic scene where uh, Jack Nicholson is on the stand and finally Tom Cruise is able to ask the Colonel Jessup, you know, what is it you want? I want the truth. And then he goes, you can't handle the truth. It's <laughs> yeah. one of those great moments in movie history. But I think that's the fact that is true to the human condition, mm. that we, even within religious views or any other views, tr we often rationalize, we bend truth to fit our own desires. And the classical view of history was, are we going to conform the soul to reality or do we bend reality to our tastes and our own wishes? And that in the modern world, that's become the modern de definition because we're all wanting to be happy. Mm. But we say in the modern world, happiness is doing what I please. In the more ancient and classical views of life, do, being happy was doing what is good, what is true, conforming to reality. And those are fundamentally uh, at odds with each other in, in history and in our time. Tell me some of the big danger points that you see in relativistic thinking. Well, it's poisonous. It's poisonous at every level. You think it, nobody likes a self, I mean, a child that grows up that's the uh, little god or goddess of the house yeah. that is then fed to be the god or goddess and goes on to, you, to school and believes that the world revolves around them, their every wish, their want, then goes on to try and have a job where they feel, I don't do the job, I just get a salary and people bow to me. You create these little narcissistic creatures mm -hmm. who live to consume. So it, when you think of it in a family illustration, like the spoiled child, which we see in the supermarkets every week we go out, or when you see on the television when they're talking and feeding back, or the reality television shows, me, 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 it's all about me. Um, it just, nobody likes selfishness. And yet we're, we've, we've, we've elevated it to a virtue rather than to a sickness. It's almost like it's, a, it's, it's an expression of, of what we need to do, what the Apostle Paul said, it's death to self. Exactly. I see my journey with Christ as a Christian as really having to die to myself daily, to well, my own wants, my own preferences. Fundamentally, that's why 
in, in the Western church, we're so insipid and so weak because many people don't take that in that, that step one in discipleship. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself daily, take up his cross and follow me. People think that that is absolutely horrendous. And yet that's step one in true Christian living. Yeah. And without and it, it, you can't survive. And it's kind of dying to your preferences. It's sure. dying to your whims and it's subjecting yourself uh, to someone and something, truth, that is far greater than you. But, but it's not moralism and it's not no. like dying to good things. It's not that I don't do art or I don't enjoy good experiences or friendship. I do, but I have a creation theology, but I also have a fallen a theology that understands the fallenness and brokenness of humanity and why I need a savior and why I need power in my life, the power of the spirit, to help me over, be overcome so that I choose the things that are good, are helpful, and are just in life and really help life flourish. So this is something that um, I've seen Christians struggle with as well as non-Christians mm. struggle with. Why do you think this subjectivism or relativism is so popular even in the church these days? Well, I think it's the air we breathe. I think in the 20th century, there was, there's been three confluence streams. The, the therapeutic revolution, the management revolution, or the marketing revolution, and the media revolution. And all of those emphasize the individual and subjectivity and preference and wants. Hmm. The market has to sell stuff. You have to please your inner, your inner child and uh, realize yourself. And media or market will wants to sell you anything. Anything is marketable. So it's all about you, it's all about the customer, it's all about your wishes, it's all about your wants. These have formed the cultural matrix in which we live now, and so that's normalized and internalized. It's the air we breathe. And we have to therefore go against the stream is to look at a counter narrative that would give a different vision of what it means to be human, what it means to do community, and what it means to live well in life. So take us there, because I think you've probably owned a lot of people. I think to some extent we're all guilty mm. of that, you know, sort of that, that devotion to self and, and selfish thinking, and maybe even a little bit truth is relative, absolute mm. on these sure. points, but you know what, I'm gonna fudge the line a little bit yeah, yeah. here or there. If you find yourself swimming in that pool, mm -hmm. how do you get out? What are some things people could do now that would help them move back toward a more biblical understanding, sure. but also a healthier understanding of where they need to be in Christ? Well, I think to me, it's all fundamentally a love question. Mm -hmm. Life is defined by what we love and how we love. Our problems are disordered loves. Our answered are by rightly ordered loves. The, the central command of the scripture is to love your Lord, your God, with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and strength. The second commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. Everything that puts my love as supreme, me as number one, is affect some kind of idolatry. Mm. So I, I do this by choosing to serve others. I do it by reorientating my loves. I do it by repenting, by saying, God, I've put something else, my desire, my power, my preferences. Pleasure has become the God or goddess of my life. Yeah. And so I have to dethrone that God and repent and let the king rule over my loves and put my loves. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there's your heart, Matthew chapter six. So we can tell, do an audit of my life by what I spend my time, my talents, and my treasures on. And there's many people who say they're Christians, but you do an audit of your time, your talent, your treasures. No evidence in the bank account, no and, evidence in your calendar. And there's your heart, mm -hmm. you've just found it. So you may be confessing one thing, but your lifestyle says something totally different. You know, it's so refreshing to hear you say it kind of starts on your knees. I think, I think life starts on your knees in Christ. It probably ends on your knees Definitely. Um, before Christ. But basically, get really honest with yourself. Right. And come before God. Is it, is it helpful as well to, like, start talking about it uh, and go, you know what, I'm more selfish than I think oh, I am. Oh, I think definitely. I mean, I know with my family, with my kids, we've had this, this, this conversation. I look at Philippians 121, for me to live as Christ, to die as gain. Mm -hmm. What would it take to, what would happen in my life? What would happen in my church? What would happen in our Christian colleges or wherever if that was the passion of every person in the pew? Yeah. So yeah. that's what I want to get to. And I, I'm not pointing the finger at other people. I want to get there myself. So how do I so love my Lord that his love regulates my life and my passions, calls up my heart, pulls forth my loyalty, and shapes all my choices. That's the kind of love I want to have. All right, before I let you go, I got one more question for you. Because a lot of parents are listening right now and they see themselves in it, but they also see their kids and they're like, I think I'm raising that kid. If you've got that child or you realize, I think we're influencing that, what are one or two things parents could do that would make a difference in the lives of I kids? I think one of the two things is get kids out. Don't just talk to them, don't moralize. 
take them into, whether it's Christian missions, downtown, into cities. Let them see people who are serving. Look at this, go and spend some time with the Salvation Army. Go and spend time with a, 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 you know, a drug rehabilitation unit. Take them out, get them out of the safety, the comfort zone, out of the burbs, out of the comfort bubble of our life and see people suffering and see people pouring out their life to help show the love of Christ who are giving their time, their education, their talents to show that other people care. That's sacrificial love. But if they only hear about it, they've never seen it, it's not the same. They need to see a model. So go find it and go do it. And I think that's the best way to draw them out uh, of their narcissism. Mm -hmm.